Welcome back, beautiful people. This is another episode of An Untold Narrative, where we host creators, artists, uh, anybody who actually just is doing really fascinating things in different fields of fashion, creativity, art. Uh, and today's guest is a little bit different. Somebody who I've admired from afar. We got to know each other a little bit last year. And we finally get her on the podcast, Janie Park, who has worked in fashion uh, throughout her entire career. She's worked overseas. She's worked across the globe and is now back stateside, I think. And so I'm super excited to have her on the show today. Um, Janie, how are you and where are you also? Yeah. Hi, David. Thank you again um, so much for having us on. Shout out Gary V and VCon. That's actually where we met. And shout out to Just Staple, Stapleverse, Stadium Goods, everything that he's doing. Um, we met at an event there and, you know, David has such good vibes in his building with N state. Um, but yeah, no, I'm doing well. I'm super hyped, um, to be on this podcast. Very honored. Um, yeah, I'm based in DC right now or outside of DC. Um, didn't think I would be back in the States after being, um, in Asia for over 10 years, but here I am back in America. <laughs> wow. So I, I got to ask, because I've spent some time um, throughout my fashion and footwear career. Um, so as somebody who's traveled over in Asia and been, you know, to mainland China, to Korea, to Vietnam, um, what do you think is the biggest difference from working there for 10 years, not only just visiting, but working there and now coming back to the States? Um, what do you think is the biggest difference in like work-life balance? <laughs> There isn't work-life balance. That's probably the <laughs> biggest difference. Um, my running joke, uh, I used to live in New York for about seven years before me moving to Asia. And my joke was that a New York minute is equivalent to an Asian second. And then, I mean, I'm in the tech space in Web3 and Web3 moves at a millisecond uh, because there's always something happening. So I think people are just always plugged in in Asia. Um, Korea, for example, you know, they expect everything is about this culture of pali pali, which in English, it means fast, fast, or, you know, whatever language you speak, andale, andale in Espanol or whatever, <laughs> uh, or fighty, fighty in Kanto. Um, but the emphasis on that is that everything needs to be done immediately. Um, if you have a business deal or you're working on something, a lot of times, like, they want an answer within 30 minutes or, you know, you're following up on something versus, you know, American culture, Western culture, European culture. It'll take about two weeks or about a month. And to put things into context, I'll share one example. Um, I was working on a resort property, um, had a retail business there through one of my old uh, jobs that I was working at. And... Um, so uh, someone higher up decided that they didn't like um, one of the establishments that was there. So literally within a 30 day turnaround, um, got a license to build, um, had a license for liquor because it was a, you know, coffee shop slash bar and it was built out within 30 days. And if you're talking about the context of like fashion and retail, Zara is insane, whereas like they have a less than 30 day turnaround from ideation, design, production and hitting the retail stores. But like we're talking about building things IRL and that's the speed of like how, um, you know, things in Asia move. No, I, I appreciate the context and I, I'm always fascinated by people who, who live in different parts of the globe and then, you know, end up for whatever reason back here. And uh, obviously it's a, it's a mental shift. Um, even, you know, it's like you want to keep going, but every, you're reaching for answers or emailing people and they're not getting back to you or whatever it is. And um, that's really fascinating. Um, I asked that question just out of pure excitement, but we skipped over the part, like if you're sitting next to me on an airplane or, uh, on the New York City subway or, or in DC or whatever it is. Um, how do you describe what you do? Because you've really transcended, you mentioned Web3, you've mentioned, we've talked about, you know, fashion, talked about living in Asia. What do you classify yourself as? Like, how do you, how do you tell people what you do? Yeah, this is a multifaceted, multi-hyphenated answer. Um, but if we're doing a, you know, a side by side on like an airplane or not even, a, I don't want to call it elevator pitch, but just to describe very quickly, um, I would say, one, I'm a content creator. 
Um, and it still makes me cringe sometimes to say that because <laughs> I used to work with influencers, celebrities, content creators. Um, and I have a, quite a few friends who are influencers who actually hate the word influencer and prefer to be called a content creator or creator. Um, but I share about fashion, tech, and trends. Um, and I actually kind of am shifting my jargon from Web3 to tech uh, because of the sort of allergy from the 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 greater audience in terms of hearing Web3 jargon, especially what's going on right now. I mean, SBF was just sentenced to jail, a uh, 25-year sentence. That was just news is hot. It just dropped. Um, and so I would say, like, one is the content creation bit, also working with brands um, to create content. I think there's a whole nother pipeline of, um, you know, digital fashion slash digital fashion um, influencers or creators that are coming down the pipe. So I'm taking my knowledge from Web 2 and applying it to Web 3. And we might have to define what Web 3 is in a moment, um, but basically more into digital fashion and tech. Um, another thing that I'm doing right now as a creator, um, I launched a blog slash newsletter called The Digital Runway. And I used to have a show previously through Rug Radio, um, which is a decentralized media network called Fresh on the Blockchain. Because I like the idea of like fresh off the boat, I'm Korean American, also like third culture adult, like lived in Asia. Uh, but, you know, when I talk to my old like C-level or executives or even uh, I'm an elder millennial, but like Gen Z that used to work for me um, and we have a conversation about what I'm working on, they just like completely don't get it. It's like an advent of a new age of the Internet. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it's really just about like keeping um, people aware of what's going on in fashion tech and trends from the perspective of someone who's worked in the business side of things um, to break it down so they can understand like what happened and why it matters and how they can apply it to their brand, their business, or even their job. Um, mm. Third area, again, multi-hyphenate here. Um, I've written for a publication before um, for BFF. My One of my dreams as a kid was to be a journalist, be um, the next Connie Chung. Unfortunately, having second gen immigrant parents, it was not an option, um, but I'm coming back full circle diving into it. Um, the fourth area is, uh, and I never thought I would get into this either. A lot of the things I'm doing right now, I never thought I would get into, which is serving as a, a business manager slash agent for artists. Sorry, that's my phone. Artists and um, designers and, um, you know, just helping them to structure their business, to strategize, as well as to negotiate brand deals. Um, and I realized that I love negotiating. I think maybe it's in my blood of being a Korean, but also having worked overseas and, you know, wheeling and dealing. And I think, you know, um, it's just something that I'm passionate about. And lastly, uh, last but not least is consulting. So working with brands on their marketing, their strategy, as well as their content. So whether or not they're brands who are already in Web3, brands trying to get into and leverage tech, um, or even uh, artists and designers. So um, yeah, I hope I've held the attention if we were sitting on a plane together. Um, but that's kind of the present and now of where I'm at. I, I think you'd capture anybody's attention with that. I mean, that is, <laughs> that is well spun. I mean, that is, uh, I mean, my immediate thought is like anybody who's, you know, out there listening to this has their core job, let's call it, or what their, their framework of what they're good at. And this day and age, it feels like you do need to multi hyphen it and you do need to like branch out a little bit, if you will. So how did you discover, you know, three through five, if you started at one to two or whatever it is, but like, did these opportunities just present themselves and you're like, Hey, I could figure this out. Like you talked about being a content creator yourself, but like not everybody thinks they're going to do that one day or not. You mentioned not ever thinking you'd manage people right and and set them up for deals and the art of negotiation and all these things and so how did these the branches show up in your life and how were you able to kind of seize those opportunities yeah honestly it was a very lemons into lemonade situation <laughs> Um, so just to give like very brief context, I'm going to time myself here uh, about what I did previously, but my career, I've been in fashion, beauty, and retail. So everything from working in retail operations uh, at Nordstrom um, to freelancing for a stylist, um, interning at Harper's Bazaar, then working for beauty brands, um, you know, in marketing, global marketing and fragrance development, launching Rockaware, um, working on Kate Spade, Jessica Tour. 
um, to then, you know, stepping into Asia um, and getting my MBA there and then, you know, climbing up the ranks over there, um, covering, you know, Asia, Hong Kong, China, Korea, Southeast Asia, also lived in Macau, Hong Kong, China, South Korea, um, did business all over. Um, and that really consisted of everything, again, from retail ops, marketing, merchandising, general management, social media, PR. So, I mean, I've kind of run the gamut of having the privilege and also worked a lot of hours to, you know, do a lot of these functions across these industries. And I think that kind of set me up as a credible source or um, it makes me cringe, but I'm going to say it of someone who has like a way of thinking or being able to connect, um, you know, what's going on in the traditional markets with, you know, what's going on in tech. And so, um, you know, how I got into it, honestly, I came back for a three week holiday after not having been back to the U.S. in three years. This was in December of 2021. And I thought it was a three week holiday. Unfortunately, God or the universe, whatever you believe in, um, didn't have the same idea because my flight was canceled five times. And then Hong Kong instituted a three month flight ban on the U.S. And so I kind of took that as a sign that I was supposed to move back to the U.S., haven't seen my parents in a long time. And it's tough. Like I only get to come back maybe once a year. And so, um, you know, during this transition um, in 2021, which is like the height of NFTs, I'd heard about NFTs and these JPEGs and these animals that people were buying and flipping and making six figures. Thought it was completely ridiculous, but was also very ignorant to just brush it off. I was like, Bitcoin, what? Crypto? Like, this is totally a scam. But I never bothered to actually do my research or in Web3 terms, they say D-Y-O-R, do your own research. So I sat down on January 1st, started digging into what is crypto NFTs. I didn't even know what Web3 was. Um, it was about four hours in and I saw the opportunity and the potential of uh, riding the next wave of trends and also the internet and leveraging tech. Um, and that's really like kind of how it got started. After that, January 6th, I made my first crypto investment, um, followed by first NFT been um, degening, um, but I don't know if I'm that much of a degen or someone who's that into the space because I think at the end of the day, I'm still have, uh, I guess, say like a realistic mindset of, you know, what the industry looks like. And, you know, there's a lot of ways we can, I guess, slice and dice the pie of what the industry looks like. Um, but just to boil it down, uh, on January 15th is weird story to share <laughs> on a podcast. But I went on a, a online date with a gentleman and he actually suggested that I share content like Gary V style. And his comment was like, hey, you're funny. You have a point of view. You have a background that is very well rounded and can be very respected in this field. Just share about what you're learning. And for me, feeling like an imposter, I was like, literally, I know nothing. I need 15 days. I was like a little tiny infant um, within tech. And I took his advice. I made my first video in the garage of my, not garage, sorry, the parking lot. That sounds weird. Um, the parking lot of my old high school um, and committed to grinding out content for six months. Like, I can't say that I've blown up and I'm like the next big TikToker. Um, but again, it's so early in this field that people recognize you because you're putting out content. And so I started then hosting, well, now Twitter is called X, but spaces, which are basically, you know, old clubhouse or like audio, um, audio conversations. And that kind of just spiraled into then consulting for different brands um, or people who are building uh, tech within the space, wanted a fashion or a retail perspective or marketing strategy. Um, and then I was also then uh, got involved with different communities. And one of them was Hug. Uh, so shout out to Hug, also Randy uh, and Debbie, because they gave me my first opportunity um, in Web3, which was to um, do sort of like this marketing and branding um, for Hug, uh, which kind of, you know, allowed me to also meet new people. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I then was hosting a show, which I mentioned earlier, Fresh on the Blockchain on Rug Radio, which is a decentralized media network. It was streaming across uh, LinkedIn and also on Twitter. Uh, Twitter for me or X is the lifeblood when it comes to Web3 tech and news. LinkedIn is corporate. 
it's where brands are, it's where business executives are, it's where money is. So I was doing that um, and creating my own content. And yeah, I mean, honestly, it's really about the attention economy of getting yourself out there, connecting with people. And, um, you know, I think I had read something that David, that you had said about just being kind to others. And um, I think there's something about giving someone um, the attention and asking questions. And I'm also a storyteller. I love interviewing. I love asking questions, learning people's stories. And really that's how I connected and made a lot of friends um, in business contacts within the space. And so that kind of then, you know, uh, segued into, um, I had a friend, um, Kim, Kim, I'll give her a shout out. And I realized my whole thing is going to be shout outs, but I'm also a person who really believes in giving credit where credit's due. Um, mm -hmm. and so Kim, um, amazing. She's a mother of two. She's also, um, you know, doing marketing over at Decentraland, which is a metaverse. She actually sent me a job posting for this digital fashion house that was looking for a head of marketing growth. Um, and so I applied, I got accepted, uh, started working on that job. My role quickly expanded then to PR and Web3, um, you know, launched, uh, you know, digital fashion collaboration or sorry, physical plus digital. So digital collaboration with weekday H&M to launch sunglasses and also with High Snobiety along with other in-house drops that we were doing. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is you make friends, you connect um, you don't be shy about what you're looking for. You share with them and people are willing to help. And I think one thing I learned in this journey is that a lot of times the people who are your in real life friends, and I love my in real life friends, A, may not be in the space that you're looking um, for in terms of work or opportunities. Um, and second, I mean, you know, I think it's really about this idea of wanting to help one another and to help people shoot their shot or to create an opportunity for you. And I think, you know, it's really um, a journey of, you know, playing the long game together and wanting to see a difference made because a lot of us do come from corporate and we don't necessarily, you know, want to experience some of the things that a lot of people do experience, you know, working in the, the workplace, either as a um, whatever gender you are or race or ethnicity or based on, you know, even what kind of background you come from or what your, you know, social or your business connections are. I mean, it's an opportunity almost to, you know, start fresh. Um, I don't necessarily think that Web3 is perfect in that respect, but I think at the same time, people want it to be different. So there's at least, you know, steps and there are people who are trying to make a difference. Yeah, I mean, Janie, there is so much to unpack there. Um, <laughs> and I think you're, you're, you're spot on in so many different aspects, like especially the, the last part of like, you know, people change people, right? And so if you're not happy with where you're at, then maybe it's time to reach out to a different network of people. And so in your case, you know, maybe that's the Twitter, you know, and you start engaging and you start joining these conference calls or spaces and you start integrating and giving your point of view and you just try some things. Right. And, and then you find your people for that specific, you know, niche or whatever you're trying to, to gain, um, out of those things. And clearly it's presented a ton of different opportunities at different points in your career and, you know, built in different brands along the resume over, over the years. And I think that's really something to extract for the audience of like, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you got to start somewhere and you can do that simply by reaching out to people, joining different conversations. Um, you don't even have to, it doesn't have to be visual either, right? Like you can join a Twitter space and that's just all audio and you don't even have to say anything. So, um, I think there's a lot of really great things that you just mentioned and you kind of overviewed for everybody. Um, what is something tangible that somebody can do to like break out of their shell? Because I think this is a huge problem of like, yeah. we are scared. We are fearful of like m misrepresenting ourselves or somebody judging us or, or, or whatever it is. And it seems like you're a very extroverted person and you're just willing to bing, bang, <laughs> boom. And like, you know, put yourself out there and I'm going to make some content and go on a date. And this guy's going to give me some advice. I'm going to take it. <laughs> and like, not everybody's willing to do that. And so if you had to like boil it down to like one piece of advice for like somebody who's looking for change, but just doesn't know where to start, like what, what would you tell them? You know, the first thing that came to mind, and uh, you're going to laugh at this, um, 
my dad has this binder, no pain, no gain. <laughs> and um, it's literally just like health tips for my mom. Um, and I think that, yeah, that's what I would say. No pain, no gain. Like you think that I'm extroverted. I say I'm shy and nobody believes me. Like I was the kid who was reading 10 books a week when I was little, like did not really want to talk to people or rather be in like, you know, reading my books and, you know, writing or like watching content or something like that or drawing um, or reading an encyclopedia about dogs, like super random. Um, but I mean, I think one of the things is, is that you realize, especially in corporate America, uh, yes, as well in other countries, but you need to get out there. You need to promote yourself. You need to share. You can do it in a non-aggressive um, and a non-shilling or sorry, non-promotional way, but just to highlight, you know, very like humbly, like you're grateful for the opportunity. This is what I worked on. These are the results that I was able to achieve um, or just shooting your shot, you know, with someone else. I mean, I remember at one point, like after my MBA, I was in Hong Kong and I wanted to find a job and it was tough to actually find something. I must have reached out to, I would say about like a thousand people over LinkedIn asking for an informational interview. Um, one person uh, in particular helped me to land my job um, and he responded and I, I, I then ended up working there. I left and then I also returned because they asked me to come back. Um, but I think it's just about keep it short, keep it simple. Okay, you want 15 minutes, you want an informational interview, you're, you know, impressed by their background. I mean, it depends on what you're, um, you know, trying to accomplish or what are your goals. There's always going to be pain. There's always going to be friction. Everyone has imposter syndrome. Every celebrity, mm. influencer, big thought leader you think out there has anxiety when they hit publish, when they're going on social media or before, you know, they go and they do a speech or a talk or, or whatever it may be. Um, but I think it's also about like hyping yourself up. And I'm actually looking right now over there because um, I have a vision board, which is the very first year that I've actually done this. Um, but like just visualizing and, you know, telling yourself again, positive affirmation, we don't give ourselves as much of a pep talk, whereas we're able to do that for other people. And I think that it's important to be kind to ourselves, uh, but also to realize there is pain through it, but you got to push through the pain sometimes, but also it's totally okay to take a break. I don't think we normalize as much. I mean, it's become much more of a topic after COVID, the pandemic, or even the protests when I was in Hong Kong, um, where you couldn't actually travel to different places. And it was frustrating. You're alone. You're in, you know, the the deep recesses of your, your darkest thoughts or even your dreams and wondering, you know, when things are going to change. Um, and I think whether or not you're in a global pandemic situation or you're in a job that you don't like and you want to do something else or a relationship or whatever it may be, um, it's really about perspective, taking certain uh, steps and being, you know, thankful and also uh, being grateful and also celebrating the fact that, you know, you may have had 10 things you wanted to do. You did 0.5 and that's OK because mm -hmm. you're still taking step in the right direction. And I think, you know, what we see on social media is not an indication of reality uh, because that is not necessarily also celebrating or sharing the, the downfalls or, you know, the failures that a lot of people have had. Wow. I mean, sorry, I just went off. I tend to no. go off and I try to keep it simple. You can cut this I'm, part, but yeah. I mean, I was just going to scream at the top of my lungs, clip it, because that is that is it. That is what we were looking for, ladies and gentlemen. That is that is like the most beautiful, well-rounded, like minute 30 way to summarize, I think, what a lot of people are feeling and nobody's talking about, right? Like there's this intense pressure to always not only satisfy the people around you, but satisfy yourself and get comfortable in your own skin. And you're going to hit these patches of loneliness and you're not going to know what to do. And you're not going to know where to turn. You're not going to know where to talk to. And nobody talks about it. We want to share the highlights. And it's something I really struggle with because like, I'm very much public on social and I try to share both sides of, you know, especially my emotions of when I'm up and when I'm down and I blog about it. And I try to do these other things just to give people perspective, but I definitely don't even talk about it enough where it is 
it's so it's so challenging when you are even motivated or you want to break out of your shell and you want to do more than what the normal expectation is and that path is so lonely and like not many people understand it and so i'm really stoked that you brought that up um you mentioned those tar- those times so i'm going to pry a little bit in like overseas and you're you know by yourself and like what did you what's like a tactic that you did to like help you get through those moments right like especially when you're 12 hours ahead like asia's not even like on the same day as like the rest of your friends or your parents who live here like how did you get through those moments cuz like those that had to have been really challenging. David, I'm going to keep it real. So I'm going to give you like the good, bad, and ugly. So the Amazing. ugly part, I would say at one point, I mean, if you know me like IRL or in real life, I'm obsessed with potato chips. <laughs> like I'm a <laughs> snacker <laughs> and salt and vinegar chips, um, Korean chips, whatever it is. I must have inhaled. Like I got what you call the freshman 1520. I got the COVID 20 at one point because I literally was bought an air fryer like everyone else. Like I was making Popeye's fried chicken by myself. And if I had other friends who were in the area who were willing to travel, because I love cooking, I love entertaining. Um, And I mean, I spent a lot of time cooking, eating, binging on content. Um, And then at some point, you realize you're at a really, really low point when... (laughs) And I know you guys will probably feel me on this because we've all been there, which is there's no more content to watch because you've literally watched everything and there's nothing else because it's uh, like a numbing mechanism, a escapism. Like you don't want to think about the present situation. You don't want to address, you know, the the emotions that you're going through. And then I think I just got to a point where I was like really feeling at my lowest. Um, and I would say like, one, what helped was accountability. Um, I have a friend, her name is Phoebe. She does not really post that much on social. She's not, um, you know, within the the tech space, but she's been a constant for me, like through and through. We would always have lunch once a week. Are we still like, you know, even now that I've moved away from Hong Kong over the last few years, have been having a conversation where we just kind of share, um, you know, pray and just like talk about what's going on in our lives. And I think that has been a lifeline for me to have someone that you could be fully vulnerable about who you are, the good, bad, and the ugly. And they're not going to judge you. They're going to challenge you. They're going to um, push you to do better, but they're also going to love you for your faults, even when you slip up. And then the second thing is, I would say is starting um, by just taking a step forward. I started to cut back on chips and literally did this whole like progress, which I never shared online, but this progress uh, photo and video situation where I just started eating better, cooking healthier, um, started exercising, working out, even if it was at home or taking a walk. Um, And I I would say the third thing is just get out of the house. And that's a Mm. struggle for me too sometimes because sometimes you're working from home and, you know, during the pandemic, it was really rough. It's hard to even force yourself outside. Maybe you haven't showered in a few days or you don't really want to go outside and face the real world because your problems seem real or the situation that sucks seems real. Um, But there's something about getting vitamin D, going outside, getting a breath of fresh air, listen to a podcast, listen to music, you know, even if it's for just five minutes, you know, like you may not be able to go on a, you know, two hour run because you're not a marathon runner, don't like running like me, but you can make one step to actually get there. And the fourth thing that I would say is journaling and meditating. So I love to write. I I love to, you know, um, I love stories. I love hearing people's stories or even for me um, to process my emotions. I think that was a really big thing for me is to see my progress along the way or see my ups and downs. And then finally is seeking a mental health professional, uh, a Mm. counselor, therapist, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I'm Korean American, also lived in Asia for 10 years. It is very very taboo to say that you have a therapist, but my belief is that a lot of our physical pain comes from mental. And so if we aren't watering our mind and taking care of it or our heart, then that manifests in different ways in our physical like actions, our physical body, our relationships, our work, all these different things. And so I took a step to do that. And I think that 
really helped me along the way because, yeah, you're paying someone to listen to you, but they're also helping you to process your emotions and what you're going through, you know, giving you accountability or giving you reading or homework or whatever you is. I mean, everyone deals with these things differently, but I would say like, those are the things, you know, from like going from my very down journey of like, you know, pulling myself out of what may have felt like a black hole during the time, which I'm sure, you know, a lot of the audience, you know, can relate to, especially during the pandemic yeah no i think that's that's really amazing that you've had the um the one like out of all five of those like the accountability aspect i think people are just like aren't aren't willing to ask for help right they have maybe even the people in their ecosystem your friend phoebe for example like you people probably have that person and like maybe they're just like fearful to ask and be like hey like i just need help being accountable here like i need to stop air frying my chicken like i just need you to tell me to stop (laughs) fucking doing that right and um yeah. and and I think it's amazing that you were able to to recognize that and take steps forward and and now it sounds like be even in a better place, you know, moving forward. And I always think about like, you know, the the mental health like cost. It's like, okay, people are willing to pay for a gym membership. It's the really the same. It's just in a different format. And so um you're just applying that cost or that expense, you know, to really better everything. And so definitely great advice on and if you don't do it already, you probably should look into it um, if you're if you're not really stoked to wake up and do whatever you're doing. Right. Because some people are and then maybe you don't need it. I don't know. Um, as we look to the future, which is obviously like we're in 2024, we're a quarter of the year through. Um, we've had ups, we've had downs. Um, we've talked about Web3. We've talked about kind of how that's transcended fashion changing and shifting um, your jobs and your landscapes and your management and your TikToks and your videos. What have you, th- like you talked about your vision board, which I'm fascinated about. Like, do you plan out the rest of your year? Like, are you a planner? Are you, are you thinking about your goals for the rest of this year? Like, how do you plan on accomplishing them? Like, what are some like key things that you're looking forward to for the rest of the year? Yeah, uh, I'm looking at my vision board as I'm like thinking, um, have I achieved everything? Um, not yet. I think it's a work in progress. Is it just a vision board or goals for this year? No. Um, honestly, I would say I at one point in my life was the hyperactive planner, color coded, minute by minute, <laughs> like super anal about how I do things. Um, And I was actually just talking, oh my God, Phoebe is getting so much love on this podcast. Uh, But I just caught up with her yesterday and I was, you know, telling this story about how, you know, I became, it it became normalized for me to travel at the drop of the dime the next day. Like my boss would be like, hey, we're going to go to Korea tomorrow because we need to do X, Y, and Z. Can you set up the meetings? And, you know, I know you're working on this. You need to get this over the line. So I would have to cancel my social schedule, set up the meetings, already always have a bag packed so that I could actually hop on the plane and go tomorrow. And I think it was one of those things that was stressful, but it taught me how to navigate in a fluid way. Like, you know, I don't know, I'm reminded of Bruce Lee for some reason, like flow like water. I'm like a huge like action movie fan. Um, But I think there's something about like, we make all the plans that we do, but life happens and that's okay. So if you need to shift things, you can shift them in your life. I mean, um, I think when it comes to like, you know, your job or if there's corporate goals or like plans or something like that, that may not be in control of you. Um, It may be your boss or even the board or investors or advisors or whoever. Um, But I think when it comes to, you know, for me, like my life is I have goals and I'm still tracking them in terms of I have, you know, weekly or monthly goals or day by day trying to plan things. But whereas before I have like 50 things on my to do list, I try to bake it down into a couple per day and also just to track what my big goals are, what the dates are and move backward in terms of like how to actually frame that into a a timeline. And if something happens, like, you know, something with family or, or whatever it may be, also not, you know, giving myself grief and putting myself through the ringer because I didn't hit those goals and those timelines because of what happened. But I would say, um, you know, my goal is for one of them is I mentioned earlier, uh, I started a newsletter and blog called The Digital Runway. 
had some family things happen, um, was off the grid with that for a few weeks. Um, and you know, it's tough to push out content every single day. Um, there are people who are super regimented, but we, people don't tell you is that they're crying behind the scenes as they're putting stuff out because it's such a struggle. But for me, like this round and this year in 2024, one of my goals is to be kind to myself and, you know, not to feel bad um, if I don't, you know, fully hit the mark. And um, I think when it comes to uh, what I mentioned before with the digital runway, I mean, I've been prepping to relaunch a video podcast have not done that yet, but also just kind of have now, you know, just looked at my original goals and now shifted it. I'm like, okay, I want to have consistency with my newsletter. So I'm going to like, you know, spend time on that first, feel a good cadence with it. And then I'm going to move on to, you know, work on the the video podcast, because I mean, I'm sure David, you know, we've mentioned it earlier offline is that it takes a lot of time to actually create that. Um, and I think for me, like the future, um, in terms of goals and what I want to do, I'm living in DC right now, you know, after kind of living all around the world, um, for most of my adulthood, I mean, I love New York, um, but it's also, okay. I don't know if you should, um, use this part, but I'm gonna say it anyways, but, um, there were TikTokers and there were people like women on the street of New York who were getting punched in the face and like, it's just wild what's going on in the world. Um, but okay, maybe you just clip that, but, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out like where I want to live and also what mm. I want to do. Um, and I think that it's an everlasting journey of, you know, finding your purpose, finding your skills, finding that like sweet spot of, you know, ikigai as they call it, which is a Japanese mm -hmm. term, like what you're good at, what people want to pay you for and all these kind of things and finding that balance, um, and pursuing it. And I think, um, you know, I think a misconception in Web3 uh, is that people are, you know, making tons of money and they are doing super well. Um, yeah, the market is doing better. You'll see a lot of, you know, um, tweets going on on X or post that, you know, the bull run is back. Um, but I think at the same time, a lot of the VCs and the investments, it's not coming in as fast and furiously as before. And so a lot of people have left Web3 to pursue Web2 jobs um, or they have, you know, gotten wrecked in the market because they overinvested and lost their money either in NFTs or in crypto or whatever it may be. But it's not even a shade to Web3. This is just the reality of the market of, you know, it's your money, it's your decision. And how do you take the steps to be accountable for your decisions and also to be wise in how you manage whether or not it's your time, your money, your career, your relationships and all these things. So I don't know. I'll just have to say end on the note. And I feel like every time you ask me a question, it's like a TED talk. But 2024, I would say like my top key words is one, have fun. Like whatever I do, like enjoy it and find the fun in it. If it's not fun, then I need to figure out why it's not fun. Do I need to not do it? Or am I missing something that's going on internally in my mind or my heart? Second is to just build. Um, hmm. You know, building a personal brand and a brand in the in whatever space is very difficult, um, especially if you're creating content. And then I think the third area is monetizing that content and helping other people to monetize as well. So, um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been an interesting journey. Janie, this has been uh, exceeded <laughs> any and all expectations I could have ever had going into this conversation. I am so thrilled. Um with not only you coming on the podcast, but sharing so many different perspectives on what's helped you, where you're at, how you've battled through them, um, how you continue to grow and be curious and learn and figure stuff out as they come. Uh, this has been so insightful and I really hope people people gained a ton of knowledge out of this. I I personally did. I'm inspired. I'm like ready to go back to work and just start crunching things and uh and doing 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 things again. And so um, this has been tremendous. Thank you so much for taking the time. Where can, um, obviously you mentioned, uh, the blog, where can people find you? What, what should they go check out? What, what should they, what's the best way to reach you? Is it Twitter? Is it, you know, IG, is it your website? Where, where, where do people go? 
Okay, now you reminded me I still need a website, David. So thank you okay. <laughs> for that push. Um, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn under the handle Jumpstar Janie. And I guess my last remark, David didn't ask me. This is just me getting into it, which is whatever it is, you know, as I said earlier, no pain, no gain, but also just to jumpstart your journey. You don't have all the information. You're not fully confident. You don't know. But, you know, the only way to move is to move forward or even to rest and recalibrate as you take those steps. So, yeah, you can find me on Jumpstart Janie. Also, um, the digital runway is on Beehive, uh, which is a newsletter platform um, that I'm writing on. Please email, sign up, comment, or if you have any questions, maybe I can make a video about it. Amazing. I love it all. So go check it out. Janie, thank you again. This has been tremendous. Thank you, David.